Hello, it's Jake here and welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is an author interview with Stefan Kinsella about his monograph, Against Intellectual Property. This article was first published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies in 2001, and it's been made into a short book, which you can find online at mises.org forward slash books forward slash against dot pdf, and it's for free. We chose this book because intellectual property is one of the areas where there is some real debate among people uh, who are interested in living the non-aggression principle about whether or not intellectual property is morally valid or the opposite. And it was this book that really changed the way that a lot of people think about this. In the 20th century, I mean, around sort of mid-20th century, most freedom-oriented people would have agreed with Ayn Rand that intellectual property is simply an extension of property. After all, if you own what you make, then, you know, you make, if you make ideas, you would then own them and that would just follow naturally. That was her view. And of course, her book, The Fountainhead, is about a guy who blows up a building because he thinks that he has the right to, since he uh, was the originator of the design. And therefore, it was you know, his design that they were building to, his idea. Um, and so, really, intellectual property was well established among freedom oriented. Uh, people as being a valid and important part of of their own of your own uh, property, and not only that, but that um, using someone's ideas without their permission would be theft and would be breaking the non-aggression principle. And some people, like Murray Rothbard, uh, argued that some aspects of intellectual property are a bit problematic. For example, patent law. Other aspects were workable, like copyright law, and there have been many sort of suggestions about ways of making a libertarian version of intellectual property. And what is interesting about what Kinsella did was he really showed that the non-aggression principle is totally incompatible with anything resembling what we call intellectual property today. And he shows in this book that intellectual property is really a state-enforced legal convention, and not an extension of real ownership. Stefan Kinsella himself is a registered patent attorney, a libertarian theorist and lecturer, and he's a director for the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. And he's also the editor of Libertarian Papers. So that's just a quick background to the, to the book and uh, on to the interview. I hope you enjoy it and thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, Stefan, to, just um, to start off, could you say a couple of words about how it is that you actually got interested in, in these kinds of issues of, um, of, of liberty and, uh, you know, and principles? Well, um, I think, um, uh, I guess around 11th grade, I read a, a librarian at the Catholic high school I went to recommended uh, The Fountainhead to me because I, I read a lot and was interested in philosophy. And... And that pretty much started it. Um, then I went to engineering and then finally to law school. And in law school, I started getting even more interested in political theory and uh, things like that, and uh, uh, including intellectual property theory and uh, all related aspects of uh, libertarian theory. Right. And in you, because I know that you have um, a sort of law training, and in the, in the book, you, you go through some of the <coughs> other ideas um, that were around um, in the sort of libertarian movement about intellectual property, um, right. how was it? How was it that you came to um, sort of address this question? You know, was, was this something that you were thinking about all the way through studying law, or what? What, what led to this book? Well, I, I mean, I, I didn't know very much about IP law at all until I sort of read um, uh, what Rand had said about patents and copyrights in, her, in one of her books early on, and, and it, her arguments made a little bit of sense to me, but not quite, but I assumed that she knew what she was talking about. Um, <clears throat> but the more I studied libertarian theory and kept thinking about IP law, um, I kept trying to figure it out and figure out a way how, how what, what she proposed made sense. And there was just too many problems with her theory there. I mean, sort of, she, she shifts to this utilitarian, almost uh, ad hoc type, type of rationale in her, uh, in her book. And uh, um, actually, in law school, I wasn't interested in IP at all. I, was, I wasn't going to, to be an IP lawyer. I never even thought about it, to be honest, until I uh, got out of law school. 
Um, but when I started practicing IP law as a, as a young lawyer, um, you know, I kept thinking about these issues um, and finally came to the conclusion that the reason I was having trouble finding a, a justification for IP was because Rand was just wrong, <laughs> that there is no justification for IP. And once I thought about it that way, it started a lot of the pieces fell into place and, um, and the whole system made a lot more sense then. Right. And I was wondering, um, uh, you know, when you were looking at this, obviously um, a lot has happened in terms of, of people thinking about IP with the rise of the Internet and with people copying things online and the, and the whole discussion you know, about whether or not IP, in a sense, is, is, just, is just unsustainable anyway because it is – so, because um, you know, uh, copying music, for example, and, and other digital things, is becoming so prevalent. Was that was that sort of in the background when you were thinking about these things, or were you just looking at it more from an abstract perspective? No, it was it was really pretty abstract, and um, it really had very little to do with the fact that I was starting to practice IP law. Um, since I knew something about the law because I was practicing it, I decided to go, to go ahead and, in the beginning of that article, just lay out systematically exactly what the law is because there's a lot of confusion among libertarians about what the law is when they discuss this topic. But I have never claimed, you know, to make an argument from authority that because I'm an IP lawyer, um, you know, I know more about IP policy than others. In fact, it annoys me when IP lawyers do that. And most of them, of course, naturally are pro-IP, um, but don't get very good arguments for it. Um, <clears throat> so it was pretty abstract. I, I think I started writing early, mid-90s, on anti-IP, and finally, I, I, I put them all together in that article, which became the monograph. And uh, I remember it was around 2000 or so. Um, I just actually had a talk with Ho Professor Hoppe uh, last week at the Austrian Scholars Conference in Auburn. And he was uh, telling me, you know, he was the editor of the JLS at the time, and he accepted my article, and um, he actually gave it its title. And he told me that when he accepted the article, he didn't think it was, you know, he liked the piece, but he didn't think it was that big of a deal. And I said, I didn't either. But it's sort of the timing was fortuitous because, um, um, you know, because like you say, the, uh, the, the rise of the Internet and technology has sort of magnified and exacerbated a lot of the problems with IP and made them more obvious to a lot of people. And I mean, if you just subscribe to enough blog, uh, blog forums, you'll see, uh, you'll see dozens of examples every week of, of outrageous applications of copyright and patent law. Right. Well, I know that um, there's a lot of people on the call, so if anybody would like to ask any questions or make any comments um, while we have Stefan on the line, then please do go ahead. I have a question. Go on, Stefan. All right. Um, yeah, thanks again. It's uh, great to, to, always great to chat with the author. Uh, this, the scarcity question, uh, it seems to me, you know, riding roughshod in with uh, non-legal expertise. It seems a little bit like betting, begging the question, which I'm sure just means I don't follow something. But um, when you talk about scarcity, uh, the lack of scarcity in ideas, uh, I think the, the way that my mind goes, when you sort of bring up this example that uh, if I have a technique for harvesting cotton that's superior, uh, if you borrow or take or copy my technique, I don't lose anything. I think that I do. Uh, you know, just from a pure economic standpoint, which is I lose the exclusive economic advantage of being the only person who can use that technique. So it would seem to me that what's scarce in the realm of IP is not ideas or songs or whatever or the copying thereof, but the profits that can accrue to the exclusive use of such a thing. And I think that's where the scarcity shows up for me. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, um, I think in a way that's, that's that is in a way correct. I mean, I don't know if you lose the exclusive right to it. But I don't know if you ever had the exclusive right to it. Um, I mean, that would be the question. Do you have a, do you have a right to profit? Do you have a right to uh, exclusively use this idea? And I mean, the way I approach it is, libertarians at least tend to agree that for scarce resources, things that are actually scarce, things that there could be conflict over, that the way we assign property rights is basically something along the lines of the Lockean first use principle. Whoever has the first uh, home, who, whoever homesteads the item first is its proper owner. Um, and so, once you agree at least on that, then it becomes clear that assigning rights in the profit or in the value of something conflicts with these other rights. 
And so right off the bat, we have sort of a conflict with what I think most libertarians would, would agree with in the first place. But I think the problem in general with saying that um, you have a, you've lost your exclusive right to profit off of this idea is that um, uh, we don't have property rights in value of things. Value, and by that I would include reputation rights, uh, the value of something. Uh, you know, you could say that if if uh, if Walmart sets up shop next to a mom and pop store, they harm the mom and pop store and they rob them of their business. But of course, they're not entitled to that business. They don't have right to the custom of the, of their customers. Um, and so, I would say that you have to think in terms of. Uh, of the praxeological status of human action, okay? So action is the use of means, which are scarce resources, in accordance with our understanding of causal law, so to try to achieve some end, right? And to use a means that is necessarily scarce, I mean, necessarily implies that if you're using it, someone else can't. So it makes sense for there to be ownership, or, the, or it makes sense to understand why there would be a need for ownership of these means. But information, is sort of what guides your action. It's just a plan you use to guide your action. And many people can use the same pattern of information, the same recipe at the same time. So it doesn't really make sense for you to have to have ownership of that pattern to have successful action. You have to have ownership of the means, but you don't have to have ownership of the information that you select to guide your action. Well, yeah, but I, I think that the effect of profit that would result from an ex- exclusive use of a, a process uh, is something that, that would be scarce because the profit would flow to you rather than to someone else. And, you know, if you're the guy who comes up with this great cotton farming thing, then you can maybe make enough money to buy up everybody else's farms and become, you know, a fat capitalist pig farmer magnet or, or something like that. So, uh, so I think that uh, the scarcity argument, uh, it, it seems to put the cart before the horse because if there is a such thing as, as intellectual property, then what is really being managed is not the ideas themselves, but the profit that results from the exclusive control of, of those ideas. Now, I'm, I'm not a fan of IP, certainly not in its current context. I'm just trying to sort of understand the thinking behind mm-hmm. it. So mm-hmm. I, think, I think you and I would agree on the non-initiation of force uh, mm-hmm. in this area, but I'm mm-hmm. just trying to understand the difference between the ideas themselves and the profits that would arise. And the profits that would arise would fall under the scarcity, but I agree with you, the ideas would, would not. I don't know if profit literally would arise fall under – profit is just a, 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 an economic description of the difference between um, you know, money inputs and money outputs or something like that. So the actual money that you have, okay, you could say that's a scarce good, the gold, right? So, so let, let's talk concretely. Um, I don't make a sale of my new razor blade because uh, someone else has, has copied the same scheme I used to make my razor blade, and they sold a similar razor blade – to a customer that I other would have sold my razor blade to. So I don't receive that piece of gold. The other guy receives that piece of gold, right? So that's a concrete example of what you're talking about. Because I don't have the exclusive state force monopoly to sell that type of razor blade, someone else received a piece of gold from a, from a third-party customer instead of me, correct? I, I don't want to go into the state enforced because I think we're in agreement on that. If we can just stick with the one that's in your book, which I think would be help, more helpful. Let's say I come up with some great way of, of harvesting cotton that produces twice as much cotton. Uh, it's some okay. ingenious machine, right? So it produces okay. twice as much cotton. Well, <laughs> clearly, if I retain exclusive use of that process, I'm going to be economically much better off than if everybody else can use it, right? Yeah, but you'd be better off because you would receive pieces of gold from people that you otherwise would not, right? Right, and I would be able to underbid uh, other farmers, and so it would be, I mean, there's economic efficiency, at least for me, let's say, and hopefully for my customers, but... Uh, it, it, that to me is where the question of scarcity is, is most important because the gold that comes to me as the result of me being a great cotton producer uh, is scarce because obviously money is, is scarce except in a fiat currency <laughs> economy. But, but, you, but you see the, the argument you have here, I think, the scarcity comes in to the question of who owns that piece of gold. Now, you have a third-party customer who owns the gold. We all agree to that, right? He yep. has the right to give the gold to whoever he wants to. He can give it to me or to someone else. If he sure. chooses to give it to someone else instead of me, then uh, he, uh, then the, then the, the uh, my competitor owns that piece of gold now. So the scarcity argument follows the piece of gold. Uh, when you say you don't have the exclusive right to use it, to me that's the sort of disguised way of saying you don't have the right to use force to stop someone else from making a similar 
uh, 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 using a similar process. So I don't know how you would have an exclusive right to do something without initiating force against uh, competitors. How would you have? How would you have such an exclusive right without initiating force? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, we can certainly jump into that. That's a fascinating question, and I'm certainly not going to claim to be any kind of expert in this field, but. My general guess would that it would it would fall the way that I view IP is that it would fall more under the the, the context of contract law, right? Mm-hmm. That you would have contracts with people, mm-hmm. and you wouldn't have any fundamentally separate contracts, or there would be no separate contact uh, contract universe in IP than there would be from you know employment contracts or absolutely uh, I agree prenups or whatever, right? Uh, that that's the way that I would see it being enforced. Now, do you have the right to initiate force if someone violates your contract? Well, I think. I hope not. I mean, I hope that there's other ways of, of managing the situation, but certainly violations of the con- of contract, I mean, I think in a, a truly free society would be dealt with by, you know, ostracism and lowered yeah. contract ratings, which would yeah. raise your costs and this and that and the other. But I think that the way IP would work ideally is, you know, there's a contract that is, uh, you buy something like a book or something, it's like renting a car. You don't have the right to rent a car and then sell it on eBay, and yep. you don't have the right to buy a book and then, you know, resell it at a profit or if you don't have a contract. So I, I think it's not something that should be separate, which unfortunately it is under the status system, but it should be under the rubric or umbrella of contract law as a whole. Yeah, I agree actually completely with that. Uh, but, look, you know, just as you are, I think, an anarchist like me, um, and yet you believe that there are certain contractual mechanisms that could replace or, you know, perform some of the functions that we pro state see the state performing now. And the institutions and agencies that would arise under a private contractual regime, you would not call that a state. Likewise, you know, if you want to arrange uh, certain secrecy or exclusivity provisions by contract, I mean, I don't have a strong objection to calling that intellectual property, but we might as well call, say it's a subdivision of IP, it's private IP or something like that, that doesn't really um, justify the public IP that is the, is the problem now. And once you admit that it's a contractual issue, then you have strict limits on how third parties can be uh, brought into these contractual webs. And IP, as I understand it, primarily patented copyright. The essence of it, and believe me, if you talk to any advocate of IP, especially uh, a, a, a mainstream status IP attorney or someone, they know full well that if you take away the ability to ensnare third parties in these rights, they totally disappear and dissipate. That's why they fight so hard, for example, uh, with proposals to add a copying requirement to patent law, which is similar, which is already present in copyright law. They know that if, if you're free to reverse engineer or to independently come up with an invention, uh, that it would basically take all the teeth out of patent law. So the entire essence of patent law uh, and even copyright law is its ability to affect third parties who have not signed a contract. But if you wanted to advocate um, – and I gather from what you said earlier, you're not in favor of the current regime. You might be in favor of some regime, and you probably would be in favor of something having to do with contract contracts that are completely uh, – compatible with libertarian theory. Most people, most libertarians, in my opinion, in, in my experience, who say they're not in favor of the current IP system, but they are in favor of some IP system, they have a much more extensive IP system in mind, but they won't tell you exactly what it is because they don't know. <laughs> right. So you know, I'll say, well, look what patent law does, and they'll say, well, I'm not in favor of that. So every, every terrible example I think of they say, I'm not in favor of that. And then I'll say, well, what are you in favor of? They say, well, I'm not, they'll say, I'm not an IP expert. How do you expect me to know? <laughs> it's almost like a theist to argue for God, and when you ask them to define it, they say, well, I can't define it. It's almost the same thing. So it leaves me frustrated as to what to ar- oppose or argue against if they can't even define what they're in favor of. Right, right. No, and I think that in a free society, you wouldn't say employment law. You would just say, I guess, contract law or whatever. It may not even be called law, but it probably right. would. But some sort of common law. And there will be gray areas, of course, right? I mean, if you are the eighth person, eighth person to receive stolen goods, are you really responsible for returning it to the first person? I mean, those Correct. things are hard to figure out. Or let's say you're living on land that was taken from the Cree 150 years ago. Are you? Res- there is going to be some gray areas, of course, right? I mean. That's just the nature of the beast. The, the purpose Correct. of a free society is to solve the 98% of the problems that are pretty yeah. obvious and then Correct. you know leave the intellectuals to quibble about the remaining 2%. Uh, so I'm very much in favor of just having it as an umbrella of 
voluntary contract law. I do think that there may be different levels, right? So there may be some people who say, I don't really want to be part of this contract law system when it comes to intellectual property, in which case they would neither be able to have it enforced against them nor enforce it against other people. I I, I mean, there could be different levels or layers, and it would be a competition for what would be the most cost-effective way of, of doing it with, I think, the rubric that there is no way to involve third parties in a dispute. That having been said, and I'm sorry to monopolize, I'll just ask one more question, which was yearning burning in my head uh, before tossing you to the other wolves, um, which was um, the question around the idea that if you have uh, IP, that you have a, a lien or some sort of third-party ownership over every piece of property in the world, right? So if I write mm-hmm. some stunningly filthy and ge- ingenious limerick that other people can't write that down if I've copyrighted it. And so in a sense, I have ownership over everybody else's property. Mm-hmm. There were two things that popped into my mind, which I'm sure mm-hmm. are fairly easy to dismiss. The first, mm-hmm. is that, uh, the first is that it's not really possible because people aren't going to randomly, like nobody randomly writes out Hamlet, for instance, right? So it's not really barring something that people would do in the normal course of events. And if they would do it in the normal course of events, like writing happy birthday, you can't copyright that because that would be sort of in the normal course. And the second... Correct. Uh, the second objection was um, that we have that anyway. Like, I can go and buy a knife, but that doesn't mean I have the right to plunge it into someone, right? So Correct. laws against stabbing are laws against, like, that's in a sense, <laughs> certain property rights uh, over everyone's property. So I was wondering mm-hmm. if you could clarify those for me. Yeah, so um, let me take the first one first. Um, um, it, it, it is true uh, that... One aspect of copyright law, which covers what's called literal copying, just an actual duplicate of the of the original item, like you know, exact copy of, copy of an MP3 file for a song or something like that. Um, I agree with you that that is extremely unlikely, probably practically impossible to occur without copying. So there is, is actual copying done in those cases. And if copyright law were, were restricted to only that, and there were no patent law, then the um, the danger done or the harm done by copyright law would be much, much uh, drastically diminished, which is exactly why copyright advocates fight tooth and nail to uh, keep from expanding the fair use exception and to uh, they, and they fight to prevent abolishing the uh, derivative works aspect of copyright law, which makes it much broader. In other words, copyright law is not just literal copying. It's, you know, if you've heard someone whistle the tune for uh, John Williams theme to Star Wars, and it kind of gets in your head. You make a rap song that's sort of centered around that. You never had a contract. You never really even copied anything. You're sort of like just generally aware by a cultural osmosis of these ideas. Or, or, you know, you may know who Superman is because you've heard people talk about it, but you never did any copying. And so you – but under copyright law, you could not make a Superman movie, for example, uh, even if you've never read or seen an actual Superman comic or novel or movie. Um, but – Let's say we restricted copyright to literal infringement, uh, literal copying. Um, still, you know, you, our computers are infested and filled with all these perfect digital copies that just from browsing the web and people emailing us things. Uh, under copyright law, you know, theoretically, the owner of that pattern has the ability to control your property, say your computer, which has that image on it. You know, you can't. Uh, or, or let's take another example. Documentary movies or just uh, uh, regular movies that are filmed in public public places have architectural works in the background, buildings, statues, uh, such as the uh, there's or there was recently a big dispute about the uh, the Korean War memorial statues by the in, in Washington D.C. Someone took a picture of those statues and they were put on a postage stamp, and then the postal service was sued for copyright infringement by the original sculptor, even though. He was paid to do these works by the government and their own government land, and they were taken by a photographer. So, you know, it sorry, that- just just to just to back that up. I mean, I when I'm on vacation, and this may occur for you as well, mm-hmm. I get paid a fair amount of money to move my pasty hide out of people's vacation photos, so they don't have to look at it again in the future. And that's just another <laughs> way of, of achieving that. <laughs> that's negative copyright. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. All right, pants on is extra. <laughs> <laughs> So, and then the uh, the other uh, example, you, could you remind me what was your second question about? Um, oh, about about yeah, about um, stabbing the knife, etc. You see, I would say this. I would say that um, I, I think that that example is used because of a sort of uncareful way of uh, uh, that libertarians often say, uh, well, your property rights aren't absolute. They're not uh, b- because you, you know you can't use your knife to kill someone. 
Well, it's, it's really got nothing to do with property rights. In other words, I can't kill you. I can't murder you because you have a property right in your body. In other words, the very rule that says I am not permitted to act so as to cause your body physical uh, damage to the physical integrity of your body is because of the presupposition that you do have property rights in your body. Now, that means I can't – I have no right to damage your body with any physical means, any efficacious causal means. Whether I own it or not, whether it's my knife or a neighbor's knife or you know, some knife that I stole from a, from a store. So in other words, let's say I steal my friend's knife. He owns the knife, but I still am not entitled to kill you with it. So really, it's not a limitation on ownership that I'm not able to kill you. It's just a limitation on my action. So in other words, ownership of, 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 of goods simply means I'm, I'm, I'm the one who gets to decide how to use it. But of course, I'm not entitled to decide to use it in a way that violates someone else's property rights. So I don't think, think there's any conflict at all between saying that there are some things I'm not able to do with my property. It's not because there are limitations on my property rights. It's because there are limitations on my actions because other people do have property rights. So, right. So in a sense, it's an, it's an affirmation of property rights, i.e. Yes. the personal property of another person, not a denial of property rights. Yes. And uh, okay. if libertarians had a disagreement over who got to own, uh, say, uh, a piece of property that's scarce, a, a scarce resource that someone found, then I wouldn't use the same argument. But I'm assuming that libertarians agree that if Stephen Molyneux has a, a printing press that he made himself out of metal he found on his land that he was the first to homestead, that you are the owner of those goods, that you do have the right to use them, and you have the right to do anything you want so long as you're not trespassing on the property rights of someone else. Then you cannot come along and say, well, it, it trespasses against my exclusive right to own this idea. I mean, why? You have to come up with an argument for it, and I, I don't see the argument for it. In other words, it seems to me that property rights are complete by specifying the homesteading principle with respect to scarce resources. Right. Right. Okay. No, that that really does uh, clear it up. And uh, I mean, I have a few more questions, but I don't want to to hog the show that isn't even my show. So, if uh, other people would like to ask questions, I'll uh, I'll I'll slither back into my con- contemplative layer. Well, if the two step and discuss it, we're likely to confuse people. So, <laughs> we both have both have pasty face bellies. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have a I have a quick a quick question, um, and this is um, just uh, an invitation to complete uh, conjecture and I, I'm so you know I know there's no way to, uh, to to tell the future but I guess there's two ways that I imagine IP could go you could say there's one argument to say you know what the, the, the rise of copying and the way that digital media is going now IP is just going to be unenforceable and the system will have to change because there's no way that um, that you're going to be able to enforce these laws. And so consequently, you know, it's just going to become kind of a joke law. And there's right. another way of looking at which you could say, well, this has been one, the one flowering of copying and now comes the clampdown and there's going to be this, you know, huge um, increase in state power to enforce IP law. And despite the fact that people will be able to find ways to copy, you know, the state, the, the, the machine will just keep kind of getting bigger and bigger. And I just wondered, you know, what, what is, how do you see things going? Uh, well, I, I mean, in a way, two directions. I agree with you in a way. Um, we do see these two these tendencies, right? I mean, it's like the drug war. I mean, the drug war is just as absurd, if not more, than IP law, and it's unenforceable, and yet the government keeps ratcheting it up and making it worse, although maybe there's some signs of uh, decriminalization in some states because of the budget issues. Um, I think, as a practical matter, it's going to be impossible to really enforce this stuff too much, but I don't know if they're going to stop doing it because there's so much political and corporatist pressure uh, behind it, and the laws are getting a little bit more draconian. We have a secret copyright treaty coming up, which is, I suspect will pass um, because these guys are good at doing this kind of thing. Um, you know, when I, when I – like, like, like in response to your earlier question, this was more abstract for me, and there are other people who have written on more practical um, – 
uh, you know, projections of like what, what kind of mechanisms would we come up with in a free society to address some of the problems that are legitimate, legitimate problems that advocates of IP see. And, you know, I used to think, well, there'd be DRM to some degree, there might be big contractual regimes, and I still think that, but um, I'll say in the last couple of years, my, change, my thinking has changed on this, that I think, it, I think that, if, you know, learning is a good thing, emulation is a good thing, and I think it's an, it's an essence of the free market and of human civilization and, and, and uh, progress. We, you know, we, it's, it's a good thing that information is not scarce. It's a good thing that we can infinitely duplicate and learn on the, uh, from, the, uh, from the insights of others and pass it down from generation to generation and increase the store of information. And in a sense, that's all IP is. It's just information. Um, so, and I also think that uh, people will just have to adjust and adapt, and I think they will. And I think the young people and the dynamic sort of um, Internet culture people are already doing it. I mean, they're putting their stuff out there. They want to be known. I mean, you know, like I think Corey Doctor has said that uh, the danger is not that people are going to rip you off. It's, it's obscurity. You want people <laughs> to learn and know, and know who you are. Um, and I think you just throw it out there and you get known. You establish your reputation. You use your skills to survive in the world. And uh, how people do it, I, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not sure how big blockbusters would be made um, in the absence of uh, copyright law. Maybe they wouldn't be made. Uh, but I suspect they would. I'm not sure exactly how. Fantastic. Has anybody, has anybody got any uh, questions or thoughts to put to, to Stefan? I just wanted to, while people are thinking, I just, sorry, I just wanted to follow up by saying that uh, I think also the, the government likes having the artists and the artist managers dependent upon the government. It, it lends them to be a little bit less critical of the government. I don't think it's any sort of smoky backroom conspiracy, but I think that it is something that uh, the ownership of the cultural elite has been pretty important for regimes throughout history, and I think that IP is more a way of hooking those people into the existing system, uh, like the welfare state does with certain sections of society. It's just a great way to keep people you know, loyal to the hand that... That's fits. A, I I never thought about that. That's a good point. In a way, the state is sort of like their patron, right? Because the state guarantees them, in a way, some some way to make money. So it's, it's, it's yeah, you don't uh, you don't get any ugly pictures of the king from the court painter, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but sorry, I interrupted somebody who had, uh, I'm sure, a more intelligent thing to say. Um, yeah, I'm wondering um, because with any like piece of technology or any product, um, you have an almost infinite number of generations leading up to it with like incremental, um, almost in, infinitesimally small incrementals of improvement with each, with each one. And um, what do you guys think it is that um, sort of help these status agencies to, um, to determine like where the stop point is for a patent or for a copyright? What really helps them determine like here is where you can't improve on this thing anymore. Um, I'll, I'll throw my two cents, and if anyone else wants to comment on this, uh, I don't know if I would have a, a lot more insight than others on this issue. But I, I will say that I, I don't want to diminish, and I don't want to diminish the role of creativity, obviously, in the mind. And you know, objectivists and Randians go completely apoplectic when you oppose IP, and they think you're basically. Uh, uh, saying that there's no role for the mind, the mind is unimportant, creativity is unimportant. Of course it is. Uh, not an, of course it is important. Um, and I also don't want to say that there are no great thinkers in history, but I do think that uh, I think that our view of the kind of great man view of history has been exacerbated by just, just standard history and just by, by maybe some of our capitalist pro, you know, pro-business worship. Well, I mean, you take the, uh, all the famous inventors that we hear about, like Eli Whitney with the Cotton Gin and others, you're right. I mean, if you think about where they are on a chain of progress, they're just one little dot in, in progress that goes back thousands of years of thousands of incremental improvements. And he stands on the shoulders of people that came up with ideas that he improved upon. And, okay, maybe, maybe his, the delta between his improvement and the previous guys is greater than average, maybe even a lot greater than average. But he's still just one dot in sort of this kind of generally rising slope of technological progress. And what he wants to do is build upon the progress 
of others, but draw like this bright circle around his contribution and get a monopoly protection on it to basically stop progress or extract the rent from it. And how does the government do it? Well, they do it with arbitrary patent law. I mean, this is one problem I have with it. It's completely arbitrary. And I mean, from, I, I see this from the inside practicing the, the laws that the government uses are completely unobjective, non-rigorous, vague, uh, subjective, you know, uh, they change over time. They change where you see a patent that was granted 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and everyone sort of laughs and they see that it was obvious in, in, in hindsight. But back then, the patent office uh, uh, didn't see that or wasn't able to see that or didn't care to see that. Um, now, copyright's a little bit different. I, I do think most copyrighted works are original. But the question is, if it builds upon the work of another, that's called a derivative work. That's the exclusive right of the original works maker. So you just don't have the right to incorporate other people's work into yours, even if it's original. For patents now, patents is a little bit different. Patents, you can build on it. You just can't use it without their permission, at least for 17 years or something like that, until the patent expires. So, I mean, I mean from a libertarian perspective, if you, if you look at the current scheme, it is so manifestly and obviously unjust. It, it boggles my mind how any libertarian could, could uphold it, um, unless you're the type of libertarian who thinks that, you know, uh, Congress and the legislature and big statutory schemes like the Americans with Disabilities Act and FEMA and Social Security, if you think all oh, those are legitimate, then I suppose you might think that this huge statutory scheme is legitimate too. But other than that, I don't see how anyone can think this type, this type of a legal system is legitimate. The other thing I just wanted to mention as well is that the government is very good at bribing organizations whose costs it has enormously raised, right? So, uh, for instance, if you look at, uh, we haven't talked about this much, and people don't bring this much in IP discussions, but of course, uh, medicine is uh, something that patents are, you know, you can measure the, the number of lives that they cost. Why do uh, drug companies need such lengthy patents? Well, because it costs a billion dollars because of government interference to get a drug to market. Exactly. And so because it's ra they've raised their costs so much, the, they need to bribe them with – otherwise the whole thing would fall apart. They need to bribe them with extensions of a patent law over medicines. And the same thing is true if you look at um, movies. I mean, why are movies so ridiculously expensive? I know a little bit about this having made one. Uh, it's because the unions have such a tight and expensive control over the movie-making process that if – uh, patents and controls over the distribution of movies were not, were not given. So they, they raise the costs ahead of time, uh, which, of course, raises the cost for consumers, and then they enforce the IP as a way of bribing those whose costs they've raised, which, again, is paid mm -hmm. for by the consumers. So I just wanted to sort of mention that's, a, no, think, that's a, incentive. That's a good point. And not only that, they make it illegal for people to come up with alternative ways to get around some of these um, uh, the, the um, costs of exclusion, for example. You know, um, it, and by that I mean like the antitrust laws, the monopoly laws. I mean, right. there, there very well may, may be uh, contractual mechanisms that big pharmaceutical companies or Hollywood companies, who knows, they would come up with to try to make this project feasible in a non-IP world. But they're prohibited from doing that because it's illegal for them to collude and conspire and all these things. So basically the government, not only do they raise their costs by, um, by the um, uh, FDA laws, the regulatory process, tort law, right? Uh, uh, taxes, which basically make everything more expensive. I mean, everything they do makes it uh, raises costs, and then they make it impossible for them to come up with with contractual regimes that would get around these things. So all they leave them is one one thing is is the uh, is, is the copyright and patent law, and uh, and not only that, there's no guarantee that with a patent or a copyright you're going to make enough money to make a certain project viable, right? Mm. In other words, if your argument is utilitarian, I mean. I, most patents are useless. They just sit on walls or, you know, the independent inventor's offices, and they're just proud they, they spent $15,000 to get it and to show it off. There's a red ribbon copy on their wall. But it, it, even some libertarians have literally suggested that the government should have like a, I don't know, a $100 billion taxpayer-funded prize fund administered by a government-appointed panel of experts, and they give out these incentive awards at the end of every year to all people that have worthy – uh, creations like a, it's like a government MacArthur Award. I mean, you know, they do this already with with government interference with science and funding, right? But so once you accept the mentality that we need to have patents and copyrights to give you a little bit more profit to make certain projects viable, well, how do we know that's enough creativity and innovation? 
Maybe maybe the government has to give you uh, you know tax people and give give money to these guys to to have even more uh, innovation. Mm. And the other tragedy too is that you end up with a pretty conservative kind of media, right? Because in this, if you look at drug companies, because it's so expensive to develop a drug, you'll get drugs for boners and heart attacks, but you won't get drugs for, I don't know, lupus or what, I don't know, whatever is, is some sort of less common kind of illness. And the same thing is true uh, in the media. It's very expensive to produce and you get this great gold rush, uh, so to speak, or, or this sort of land claim of intellectual property afterwards, which means that you'll get, you know, big budget, which has to appeal to the widest majority to make the most money, but you won't get the kind of smaller budget films and the distribution that would go on that I think would give more more challenging perspectives. You can get those from foreign films, but it's not really quite the same. Anyway, I don't want to get us too no, off. I, th- I, th- I, think. I think people get used to the way things are, right? They see this, a certain percentage of big, big Hollywood hits and the big bandana type rock stars, and they, they, they cringe in horror at the thought that we might have more serious artistic efforts and more independent artists or whatever the, the landscape would look like in a less distorted regime. And they just, they're basically conservative at heart because they, they can't stand the idea of change. They think the way it is is the way it has to be. Right. And if that's all you've grown up with, then it's almost by definition what you can end up being used to. If you grow up with change, right, it's like those people who, uh, who still long for the days of Stalin, right? If that's what you grew up with, then that's kind of what you want to continue. So I think it would yeah. be quite a change. Yeah. But I think, Greg, you had a, you had a question for Steph. Uh, yeah. Um, near the beginning of the book, um, you rightly point out that um, uh, the, the, uh, that IP uh, essentially, I mean, it, it centers around um, when the use of force is justifiable. Yes. Um, but 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 I think, um, and I could be misinterpreting what I read. But I, I think that. Um, you meant that in the sense of when is it justifiable to defend my property with force? Uh, is that correct? Um, I honestly don't recall um, what the context of that was. Um, I probably was just setting the the context from a I was presupposing libertarian um, a libertarian framework of the understanding right. of the proper use of force and its relationship to property rights. Right. Right. In other words, when you define a property right, you're basically saying. It's, it's, it's permissible to use force um, in a certain, you know, to defend that property right. Although I would tend to agree with Stefan, by the way, on, on the uh, on the probably the likely prevalence in a free society of ostracism and things like that instead of actual physical violence in those cases. But but anyway, theoretically, right. To define a property right implicitly defines a correlative right to use force to enforce that right. Right, right. And and so the the question to me actually is. Where does the where does the original initiation of force take place? Because to 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 say that I have the right to use force to defend implies that someone has used force against me already. And so I was wondering in the in the context of intellectual property, where does the actual initiation of force first take place? Like. Is someone actually uh, aggressing against me if they copy my song or if they um, photocopy my my book or uh, they r- r- repeat uh, a manufacturing process that I use or whatnot? Is that well, actually an act of aggression? Well, okay. So let, I, I think I follow your question. Let's let's break it down to the different elements. Okay. Um, um, now. We have to decide whether there's a contract or not. If there's a contract, then then it's, then it's debatable and it depends upon your concept of contract rights. Um, what would happen if you if you copy something in contravention, violation of contract? But let's 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 set that aside. Let's assume there's no contract. So um, you know, let's say you come up with a uh, um, what was the example we gave earlier, a new method for harvesting cotton or something. Uh, or even a simpler example. Let's say that uh, you know, we, let's take some cavemen, and one guy, you know, live, everyone's living in caves, and one guy gets the idea to stack a bunch of logs and make walls and lives in a little hut, and they give him some advantages. And his neighbors see that, hey, this guy's a, this guy's got a, a house, and so they start making houses on their land. Now, you know, if the first guy runs over and burns down the second guy's house, I would say that's an in- initiation of force. Uh, I agree. 
now the the advocate of IP would have to say it's not, and he would have to say that it's a response. It's, in my view, we, we have to, as libertarians, we have to break down force into initiatory and responsive force. That that's my sort of binary classification. It's either initiated, which to me is a shorthand for invasion of others' property. So it really is dependent upon concept of property, but still. There's initiation and there's forces in response to initiation force, which is responsive force. And that would include restitutive force, defensive force, or even retributive force theoretically. But basically it's not initiated. It's in response to force that was initiated. So to say that the you know the the log cabin inventors burning down his neighbor's house is responsive force, you'd have to say it's that the first guy building his house was initiated force. Now the only way to argue that is to say that you know the first guy had a property right in the building of log cabin houses all over the world. And to me, that's begging the question because that's what the property that's what the IP advocate wants to prove. So you can't rely upon standard libertarian principles to argue this. You have to come up with an extra argument. You have to you have to give a reason why that this guy building a house gave him any rights outside of that house. Other people's property, which they already owned. Now, in today's society, the way the force happens is because of the government. So you have, uh, um, you know, Intel will file a patent on, the, on on a chip design or something like that, and they'll get a monopoly grant from the government. And if someone else violates it, they'll send them a threatening letter. If they don't pay pay them money or stop doing what they want them to do. Intel will go to the courts, and the court will. If Intel wins, the court will order its, you know, the, the agents to go and seize money from the bank accounts of the of the loser, or they will issue an injunction saying you cannot make this product, and if you do, it's contempt of court, and we will come put you in jail. So there is literally force used by the state, and what we have is we have libertarians saying that is justified force in response to aggression. By the competitors. Okay, so this is the sorry state we have now. We have libertarians basically siding with the thugs of the state um, against people who are only producing useful products to sell to people. Right, right, and, and it's 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 basically uh, um, that's to see to me that's the actual initiation, right. Because well, sorry, but unless you accept the argument that the future profits of exclusivity is what's being stolen, I, I'm not saying that's my argument, but but that is the IP argument as far as I understand it. That the future profits, so the log cabin thing is like, well, if other people don't buy, sorry, if other people don't build the log cabin, then they're going to pay me five bushels of wheat for me to build it for them, and so I'm out five bushels of wheat. Uh, this guy has stolen from me the five bushels of wheat that I would have over the exclusive right to build a log cabin, and therefore I'm going to burn his log cabin down in some rocky and orgy of homicidal violence because uh, I'm out five well, bushels of wheat. Do you think that the argument makes any sense yourself? Well, this is the challenge, which is to me, is this is why it's such a loop-back procedure to argue these things, because in a sense, if you accept intellectual property, then you are out five bushels of wheat and you have every right to go and get those five bushels of wheat back. And if you do invent something from, from Intel that might make you a billion dollars next year and then somebody takes away that billion by copying it, then they have initiated force because you are owed a billion dollars. It's sort of like stealing somebody's stock portfolio. Well, maybe it'll make money, maybe it'll lose money, but I want to have the opportunity to make money. So um, I think... I, I don't have a great answer for it because I, I'm just not that smart or experienced in, in the topic. But I just wanted to point out that this is the framework that the two sides are working. So the one side says you don't have a right to potential future profits. And the other one says, well, they're not potential future profits if I already have the right for exclusive control over the process. No, and so yeah, I, I think that's that. the justification for IP, that you are stealing the money that I would have made if I had had exclusive control. Yeah, but, but again, it all seems like begging the question. Sorry, but, but, don't but, but, go ahead. Phrases like exclusive control, um, I mean, what does that even really mean? Well, it means that if I invent the computer chip, you can't just reverse engineer and copy it. Um, and, and so that they're saying if I have control over this computer chip, I come up with some computer chip in my basement that's 10 times faster than the fastest computer chip at one-tenth the price. 
I'm going to be a multi-bazillionaire, right? And if somebody just goes and steals and copies that, then uh, I'm out my multi-bazillion dollars, and that's been a direct theft uh, from but, my invention. But, that's the but, pro-IP but, position, again. That's just wanted to clarify that for but, me. But to be clear, like patent, and this is the language is given mostly by IP advocates, the stealing language, but patents don't require copying at all. So in other words, it not only prevents you from copying the idea, reverse engineering it, or stealing it, it, it prevents you from even independently inventing it. It even can prevent you from using the idea if you came up with it independently before the other guy, and you just basically didn't want to get a patent on it. So you didn't go to the patent office. You didn't disclose it. And someone else independently invents it later. They apply for a patent. They get a patent on it. They can stop the first guy from doing it. So it's more than just copying. Um, no, and that's yeah. right. And I think the good example of that is that Amazon one-click thing that's in the back of the book that someone else may have come up with a one-click way. They've never been to Amazon, and they then can't use that. And I think, I mean, I think that's really, really tough to defend, uh, uh, even even for pro IP advocates. I can sort of see yeah, something why? pretty complicated and exclusive, but something that's developed independently is not something that can, is not obviously is not copied. Right? The question is proving why? the challenge is proving the independent uh, creation. Why is that hard to defend, though, if your position is that um, Amazon's imputed income is going to be damaged? It's going to be damaged by somebody else having a uh, one-click. Well, Ayn Rand did defend defend this. Uh, In her book, she did defend this practice. I mean, it was a stretch of an argument, but she did try to defend that. You mean that even if you didn't derive it, that it was still illegal? Well, she defended in her article the what she thought was the practice that the first guy, like, let's, she, she did the idea that let's say two guys did it at the same time, and the first one to get the patent office gets the, uh, the, the patent, which actually not the U.S. law. She, she actually did not understand the law, but she thought the law was the first guy to get the patent office wins. So she, she came up with an argument, why can't she get it, even though the other guy independently did it. So I think her position would extend to someone who... Well, yeah, it, 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 in fact, it does. And, and, and in fact, when you have a tie to patent office, it's the sign that the idea, time has come to the idea. It wasn't, it was obvious anyway, you know. Hmm. We, we actually have a... a we, we have a recent example of this, too. Um, uh, and uh, by, by your own argument, Steph, Apple was actually justified in doing what they did by um, suing HTC for the slider widget on the Google phone. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I just, I think that, I mean, to me, Apple and Microsoft suing anyone over stuff that they all stole from Xerox uh, way back in the day just seems kind of funny. But uh, I, I, I don't know enough about that. And I mean, I wouldn't even venture to and understand. This is not my argument. This is just an argument that's important to understand if you're going to look into you know, I, I always think it's really it's really good to give your opponents the best possible arguments that you can in order to make sure that your position is as battle hardened as possible. Yes, yeah, so Steph, what we did, what we, Steph, in your opinion, that the um, IP, the pro IP guys way of putting it that um, um, they, it's a property right in this monopoly, in this in this exclusive right to the stream of profits or something like that. That, that, yeah, that, that I'm going to make I'm going to make X amount of money by exclusive control, and if you violate my exclusive control. Then it's like stealing a cab that I have, in a sense, right? No, no, I mean, no, I'm, I'm out that income. Yeah, but you, you integrated that rightfully, I think, you say question begging. But I thought you also said that the opposite view was question begging, too, which I don't think it is. I think the libertarian perspective that you have a property right in property that you homestead, it's not question begging. It's a statement of what the libertarian position is. And, and, uh, and I, I agree that stating it is not proving it. I don't think it's question begging. I think it's just assuming that we all agree. Basic principle. I think you can defend it with other arguments, which you come up with that others can come up with. But I, I think that like an exclusive right to profit is actually um, a disingenuous because they're avoiding stating starkly what they're really in favor of. Um, what they're really in favor of is control of other property so that they can make profit. It's not the right to the profit, it's the right to control other people's property to stop them from they can, so they can make profit. Um, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I, I think, again, to play the IP position, I think that they would then say, but if other people would 
in a sense, accidentally or independently come up with it, then it shouldn't be a law. But if it, nobody is going to, uh, you know, the moment the Bohemian Rhapsody is going to come out, nobody is immediately going to say, oh, I just finished that exact same song in my basement. Then the odds against that would be so, so, so large. So where it's functionally impossible for other people to use their property to duplicate the profit-generating item, then, uh, then they are copying and stealing from the ingenuity and creativity from the the original creator. So I think that there's those two poles, one where it's very clear, like you don't accidentally recreate an Intel chip, and the other one where, you know, it's a, a two-line poem that somebody else could come up with, uh, that those two poles would be pretty far apart. And the IP, I think the hardcore IP guys would say, we're only really concerned with the ones that would be impossible for other people to accidentally reproduce. Well, I think, I think again, I think if, if they were to see that, they actually were getting up 99% of all pipe all P law damage, and they, they're not going to do that. Um, but uh, you know, it, let me just make a point on on, on the profits idea. This is all uh, 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 typical of the type of libertarian thinking, which is typical of objectives, especially which is not uh, representative of the way Austrians think of things. Um, Austrians and Austro libertarians think of property in terms of the uh, the, uh, the actual scarce resource. As, as, as defined by certain borders, and, and they think of trespass as invading those borders, which means using the property right. I'm sorry, using the resource without the owner's permission. The objectivists, and this is another reason why the objectivists believe in reputation rights and defamation law. They had a, they basically believe in property rights and the value of things. Um, and the fundamental problem with that, as Rothbard pointed out in the in the Ethics of Liberty, is that. Value is a subjective phenomenon. The value is what other people think asking something to be. And to have a property right in that is not to have a property right in, in other people's minds, basically. Uh, and so this is one reason why over the few years I've come to think of, of reputation rights as another type of IP. It's, it's not typically classified as IP, but I think clearly it is. It, it's just, it goes by the same type of reasoning. The objective is say, if labor on something, and give it, and you, they say you create a value. Think of a value as a noun, right? It's a thing floating out there that, that is a value. If you create a value, then you're, of course, the owner. I mean, who else would be the owner of this value other than the creator? They never stop and ask the question what types of things are ownable in the first place? Mm. What types of things are property in the first place? Right? So basically, if you believe in IP, you're going to have to believe in defamation law, reputation rights, and. To, I think basically they're all just protectionism by the government. The government is giving favorite, favorite, laws to favored parties, favoritism, and they're protecting their market. It's, it's nothing but, but modern liberalism. Right, and, and if people say, well, you're creating a value, again, this is why it's like, to me, these always become like determinist arguments and that it's always begging the question. I don't mean that that's what you're doing, Steph, but, but that approach where you say, well, you've created a value. Well, but it's only really value because you have intellectual property exclusivity. Right, so so in a sense, you're. It's not a value if if there's no IP. So it's begging the question about whether there should or shouldn't be say, to say that, there is I value. Say, I would say we don't create values. We actually make things that we own more valuable by transforming them. Okay, but we don't actually create value. Even Rand admitted this. There's a passage in one of her writings where she says we don't ever create matter. All we rearrange it, and she's correct about that. And right. she, the, the, the fundamental problem for libertarians is we bought into the, the idea that it's sort of losing get rights. People will say, well, how do you get property rights? And we'll say, well, there's several ways you can get property rights. Someone can give you something. You could transform your own property. You could find something unowned and homestead. Um, or you could create something new. And they kind of throw these things together in a big sort of gumbo of, 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 of ways of, of, of coming up with property rights and things. But if you look at it closely, creation is not really an independent way of coming to own things. I, I remember I had I had a, a this on the or, or a discussion on the Mises list several years ago with Jordan, who's one of the reasonable objectivists. And he was sort of trying to fit he was trying to discuss intelligently honestly, right? But he was trying to fit it into this framework. So he was trying to argue that so if you transform your own, let's say you have a you know a piece of steel and you you hammer it into a sword, right now, any objectivist would say you created a sword, you created a value. 
and therefore you own it. But they don't seem to realize you don't need to say that you own things you create to own the sword because you already own the steel. All you did was change its re rearrange its, its, its shape. So you already yeah, because if you stole the steel and made a sword, you wouldn't own the sword, right? Of course. So crease is not necessary. It's not a necessary nor sufficient for ownership. And the reason said, well, but the, the sword is a new thing, and the only reason you own this new thing is because you created it. So creation is a source of ownership. But you see, if you have to resort to this kind of argument, I mean, it's just semantics at that point. Okay, fine. But that still doesn't give you the right to own your reputation because you created it, because it's not analogous to the steel. Right. I also think uh, this is a point you raise in the book too, uh, Steph, that um, there is uh, – we, we don't know what the opportunity costs of IP are, um, what, what would be present in the world in the absence of IP. And, you know, of course, my own uh, story is fundamentally about that, that, I mean, if I tried to sell my show, I, I'd still be yelling at traffic in my car. Um, but the fact that I've given everything away for free, so to speak, uh, has really opened up a business model that wouldn't have been there before. So if I'd chosen to exercise intellectual property rights, uh, I would uh, have an entirely saner career. But um, I think it would be very interesting to see what kind of decisions would be made in business and in the arts uh, in particular without this. What, what kind of uh, resource flow would change without IP? And I think you would get a lot of creativity that currently uh, isn't there. I agree. I'd love to see it. I think, I think we're seeing a bit of it, uh, you know, with the digital commons and with, you know, a, you know, here's a striking thing about a copyright. Copy at least at least with patents, you don't have, you don't have a patent unless you apply for one. Okay, and if you want to prevent someone else from um, from getting a patent on the same idea that you had, you can just publish it. You can just publish an article somewhere. Um, and, and that makes a prior art and makes someone unable to get a patent on it later. But copyright is the thing the government gives you, whether you apply for it or not, whether you put a copyright notice or not, whether you want it or not. And you can't get rid of the thing. I mean, you know, if you, let's say you want it to be as part of the, uh, the uh, public domain, give, give everything you do to the public domain, like you do, as a matter of fact. The problem is you could sue someone tomorrow for copying your show. Okay, even if you said before that you weren't going to sue people because you still have a copyright on it, huh. right? So the government gives you this stupid right, and they won't even let you disclaim it. They won't even give you a process by which you can do it. You can only have a contract with, with a particular person that they sign with consideration. Other than that, there's no reliable way to do it. People try these things. They say, well, just dedicate it to the public domain. You can't. I mean, you can say words, but that doesn't stop you from filing a lawsuit. Or winning. Right. So, I, uh, copyright is like the road to motel, right? You can check in, you just can't check out. Well, yeah, it's, it's like it's like uh, you know, it's like any other right, like any like, uh, discrimination rights. You know, if you're a minority, you want to apply for a job at some company, you, you might want to tell the employer, "Listen, if you fire me, I promise I will never sue you for racial discrimination." But that promise is meaningless, and the employer knows it. you can't make that promise because you do have the legal right to sue for racial discrimination later. You know, but due sensitivity to, uh, to Steph's vacation hey, schedule, I just wanted to make sure – sorry, just wanted to make sure we got – if there are any other questions. Uh, I know that the, the sunlight is, is calling you to <laughs> to slowly explode on the beach. I uh, just wanted to make sure we got all the questions in that people might have. Um, I, I had one, but this is um, this is an argument that, that I use often that none of the, the pro-intellectual property people can seem to um, tell me that I'm wrong about. So, for example, the, the current – um, patent laws of the United States allow people to patent living organisms where that patent extends to future generations of the patented organism. So um, big seed companies like Monsanto, for example, have been suing farmers whose fields have gotten pollinated by corn that was grown from Monsanto seeds, but the pollen has traveled and has, you know, replicated itself in fields where the farmers didn't buy seeds from Monsanto. So Monsanto is then suing those farmers for um, patent violations for, you know, growing Monsanto, quote-unquote, corn without being um, 
paying Monsanto. So I, I don't understand, like, how anyone can say, number one, that that's deprived Monsanto of money because the farmers didn't want to grow that kind of corn in the first place and how the the patent would apply to future generations of an organism that's self-replicating mm-hmm. well i mean i've heard i've heard the stories too and they're they're just another example of a of an obvious and manifest injustice of the patent law and the problem is we point, it, this is just another one of those things point them out to the ip advocates the liber- at least libertarian idea, because they'll say, well, I'm not in favor of that. I mean, they just basically buckle on every every bad example you give them. They'll just say, well, I'm not in favor of that, of course. Right, and of you course. Say, well, what are you, in favor? you say, what are you in favor of? They say, well, I don't know. I'm not an expert. <laughs> I mean, right, like uh, you hear horror stories in the Bible, and it's like, well, I don't like that stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, but, right. but the, example, the example you give is similar to what used to be called marine patents under U.S. patents. And that was the phenomenon whereby um, you could file an application. They used to stay in and they could they could stay in what they, what's called prosecution between filing and when they issue. They could stay in prosecution for theoretically for in some in fact, this guy Jerome Wilson filed all these windshield wiper patents and other things. He called them life in the fifties, but he kept kind of just refiling them and earning to the patents that he saw technology change. And eventually other people invented intermittent wind wipers and things like that. And he just waited decades until um, everyone had adopted it. So in other words, the industry had adopted it all. It's just like you reminded me of this because the farmers basically are getting these getting these seeds in their in their in their fields and they, they, it's not even their fault. They're just growing because they were just given it, right? So the submarine patents uh, was a phenomenon where Say 40, 20, 30, 40 years later, finally, I would let his patent issue, and it would serve like a submarine, big juicy targets to sue because the entire industry has, in, has embodied technology, point technology, because they didn't copy it from him, but they, just it. They, they independently invented it later, and they just started using it. So he sues everyone. He, I mean, he got a, his, his patent lawyer was worth $500 million in his fees, literally. Uh, when Limelson died, Limelson was worth 1.5 billion or something. Doubt all these funds all over the country. He's just one example of many of these things. Um, that danger was uh, was ameliorated a little bit in eighty five when the government changed patent law a little bit to reduce the term of patent uh, from from seventeen years from the date of filing to twenty years from the date of, of, of I'm sorry, seventeen years from the date of issuance to to twenty years from the date of filing. So now. There's a penalty. The longer you get it hidden, the, the, the less term you have left. So the submarine patent problem has sort of gone away or been reduced. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a good example you gave of the Monsanto case. Yeah, the, the, the only other thing, the, the other question that I, I usually have for IP people is, the the patent law also it allows you to you know as far as I understand it to patent anything that has not had a prior patent on it. So for example, again, like when companies like Monsanto go into seed banks and they patent like heirloom varieties, like seeds that were you know sat there since the 1800s and and nobody really invented them. And then you know they they use the, their patent to jack the price up. That's another um, example of the same thing. But I, I agree with you. Yeah, what, I agree with what, you. What that you found this IP, IP people. Sorry. Go ahead. Then from Mars. Um, but I agree with you that the response that I always get on both of those questions is, "Well, I'm not in favor of that," and then they they can't tell me what they're in favor of, which is rather annoying. No, it is. It is. So maybe we should just basically put a petition out there with like a hundred checkboxes. Do you agree with this? This. This and, and get all the uh, pro IP people to agree that they're against every one of those things. I guess they were done. <laughs> there we go. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for um, taking the time to, to talk to us. I know that you, you probably do need to, to get back to the beach. So, uh, really appreciate your, um, your, your uh, uh, coming and, and uh, taking part in the conversation. Thank you much. Thanks. Have a great vacation. And, uh, Thanks, bye-bye.
Do you have any? Do you, thanks a lot. No, no, that's great. Thanks. No, I'm here. Did you have another question? Oh yeah, I just wanted to ask. Uh, did you did you have any other uh, uh, publications coming out? Um, you know, anything to tell us about? What are you working on now? Well, I have uh, not much on IP probably, but I uh, I'm working on a collection of essays of, of my uh, legal theory related articles, including this one. Um, and the next thing I'm working on is sort of like a, a 40, 30 or 40 yeah. common libertarian myths and misconceptions. It'll sort of be a, a, a short, punchy, fun read. But other than that, just uh, just taking my time with, uh, new, with new projects and, and libertarian papers, which is the journal I started. So I'm having spending a lot of time editing that and getting new submissions for that. And I presume that people can find that online, the libertarian papers. Yeah, that's libertarianpapers.org. It was founded uh, in January of last year, uh, 2009, and uh, it's, it's, it's going really well. We had 44 uh, papers last year, and uh, the, uh, the, winner, the, the winner of the Alfred Prize was announced at the Austrian Scholars Conference in Auburn last week, which is one of those papers. And uh, it's going really well. I've, I've already gotten several submissions just from the papers presented at the Austrian Scholars Conference in, um, at the Mises Institute in Auburn. So uh, that, that takes uh, some of my time, and it's, uh, it's, it's fun to do it. Fantastic. Okay, well, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.